Okay, we'll give it a minute or two more. And give it because I just sent out some more notices. And if you anybody here would like to call out to your friends, please, please do. Oops, I think I have to put my box on the table. <laughs> kind of fell off. <gasps> okay, so I guess we should start since we're on live stream here as well as recording this for all of you who are here today. Um, I want to introduce to you Dr. Stephen Gazier, who is going to speak about why we age and what to do about it. He's going to present, <coughs> excuse me, he's going to present current molecular and physiological models of aging <coughs> and implications for treatment, regimens, and lifestyle. Based on these models, we can discuss how drugs, medicine, lifestyle activities, and even gene ther therapy would be useful based on each model. Stephen is a molecular biology scientist who was first introduced to Second Life while teaching biology at the University of New Orleans. His interest in virtual worlds was piqued when the distance learning team there offered a workshop in Second Life. It wasn't long before he's gotten himself an avatar and was looking at ways to use SL to teach biology. I taught three semesters of biology to non-biology majors in Second Life from the summer of 2010 to the spring of 2012, he says. I also developed several in-world activities and objects for teaching virtual, for virtual teaching of biology and chemistry. Wanting to do more than just lecture, he recreated and took students on Darwin's voyage aboard the Beagle, arranged a visit to Mendel's Abbey, and taught them the basics of genetics by having them breed virtual bunnies, using the affordances of Second Life just as they should be used. Currently, he's focusing his efforts on promoting science circle activities here in Second Life and outside, and working at Corteva AgriSciences. And I'd like to say welcome, Stephen. Thank you, Wisdom. And thank you for the opportunity to uh, present one of my scientific interests that are not uh, in line specifically with my job, something from a bygone age of my molecular biology research. I'd like to welcome everyone to the talk. I think this is a great conference. There needs to be a lot more attention on aging well and whole brain health is a wonderful organization for helping people both physically and mentally uh, try and age in the way that maintains happiness and health this is also a great time for this type of talk and update because one of course we are living in an aging world the average age of people uh, is increasing because of the advances of sanitation, medicine, uh, overall wealth. The other aspect, though, is that really in the past, I'd say 15, maybe 20 years, there has a been a tremendous amount of research at the very basic level that has given us a brand new understanding of the real basic physiology of what aging is uh, from a very cellular and physiological level. And I think it's very important to update and talk about this uh, 
because in a modern world where people are trying to make money, in many cases, they're trying to delude you into a solution uh, that is not based on reality and it's not going to help you. So I think conveying the basic science of aging is really important for people understanding the context of what will and may not help in terms of healthy aging, especially when it comes to supplements or other um, things you might do. So I wanna make a quick note that there is a box here on the stage and that has both the conference program as well as a note card with the references for my talk. But those will both be made available on the conference website uh, within the next week. And so let's begin. Overall, again, this is only going to be a 45 minute talk. It's going to be an overview to try and convey some basics. Uh, so in general, we'll talk about kind of what how we define aging, especially when it comes to something in your basic science research labs. What are they measuring? How is that actually objectively figured out? And then I'll talk about what is the primary model for aging that scientists are working with and seem to have the most evidence and support for. And I'm going to talk about various drivers of aging. And I use that term uh, specifically because I don't want to necessarily imply that any given one of them is the direct cause of aging, but we do know that they are associated with the aging process. And we have within the models of aging very specific reasons for why we think they are very important things that are driving the aging process. And based on how we are understanding those, I'll both show some examples in the scientific literature of interventions that alleviate those drivers of aging and then kind of bring that back around at the end for the conversation we'll have about what this means for healthy aging in terms of what you might come across in the clinic, what the future of aging therapies might be, and what you may want to think about in terms of uh, supplements. So I do want to make one other quick note too, which is especially if you're a researcher or a scientist or do some follow-up research on this, one thing I do tend to do in my talks is to bias my resources to those that are publicly available. That way, uh, again, there are times where there are places I've worked or ways where I have specific access to things, but I wanna make sure that the examples I give are something that are also available to you if you wanna follow up on that information. And then the other bias sometimes is I try and find the best simple explanation and scientific evidence that also they, that where the original publication has a very nice, as many concepts as possible in one graphic so I can convey it to you. So this is a little bit of a bias that way. So if you're wondering why I may or may not talk about somebody's research, that might be why. So when we think about aging, you know, a lot of it is I know it when I see it. And so we all can associate the prevalence of gray hair as something that comes to us as we age. Uh, skin getting a little more wrinkled, maybe a different gait or stooped um, uh, shoulders. Again, these are very systemic, visible signs of aging that we understand are associated with people as they get older. But those tend to be a bit, in many ways, cosmetic. More um, importantly, in some cases, our hormone levels, what's actually happening in terms of our cells and our tissues and our physiology is that there are chemicals and chemistry that's actually changing. And so one example I have here is talking about testosterone, that as uh, in particular men, as they get older, those testosterone levels decrease. And there are very important functional consequences to this is that with a lack of with the decreasing in testosterone you might lose a feeling of energy you might lose some degree of sex drive uh, also the ability to exercise and put on muscle mass these are things that have very functional consequences to how we uh, live our lives and then to that next level of consequence on the lower left hand side i'm showing the uh, mortality curves from a recent uh, pandemic that swept around the world. And if you look at this graph, what you'll notice is that there was a very big bias in the distribution of fatality, and again, also uh, the severity of effects from it. 
but that this disease susceptibility is something that is consistent among a lot of different pathologies as we get older. And so in addition to disease susceptibility, just like pneumonia, COVID, you can also think about things like cancer or age-related dementia. And so here's an example of this, is that when it comes to neurological impairment, this is something that has a high prevalence of effect and something that is increasingly prevalent in modern day society. There may be things that are driving neurological impairments, pathologies due to lifestyle or the environment. And so uh, I believe the current estimates in the Western world is that by the age of 65, 10% of people will develop Alzheimer's. By the age of 85, that's somewhere in the range of 30%. And there is a very, very big cost burden to things like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's diseases. There is certainly a decrease of enjoyment and mobility and activity within your own life. And then the medical bills and societal cost of that is very large and highly consequential. Another aspect too is as you get older, depending on um, what things have happened to you, there's this idea of frailty. Again, you can a lot of people, when you, when you think of some of them as being old, it's because you're seeing them with a slow gait, maybe a cough, they're stooped, they're very slow to react, maybe they're even shaking a little bit. Uh, in my own experience, they tend to be the ones driving the slowest in the left lane. And so that frailty is something that, again, has an incredible amount of con uh, impact on the enjoyment and activity that one has in their life. And what I want to show here, in particular on the slide, is the attempts to, from a whole body point of view, try and find ways to measure objectively aging. And so again, in terms of the specific aspect of what we call frailty index, is you have several survey questions, you observe people, uh, you have to put them on a treadmill, watch them walk, and you measure a lot of stuff to get an objective sense of what is their frailty index, which we know is then related to the aging process. And of course, once one can start developing these uh, indices, these ways of measuring it, then you can also measure whether interventions that you're trying to help with are improving that. So that is a bit of the whole body perspective on aging and the, the physiological consequences. As a molecular biologist, I wanna make sure uh, I convey and what the field is doing is the cellular level of phenotypes that we associate with the aging process. And so again, I'm not per se as of yet talking about what is a cause of aging here, but we do know that when we look at the cells of people who are older, we see hallmarks of they have fewer stem cells, and stem cells are the important cells to replenish tissues within our body. Some of those cells are slowing down. They're becoming what's called senescent. They're not doing much, but they're still there. They might have other energy or regulation or uh, chemical compound abnormality. So things related to the mitochondria, which makes energy for the cell, how well their DNA is packaged, uh, whether their proteins are working or not. And then also the inability to recycle that. So the term uh, autophagy, autophagy is um, this ability to recycle the broken down components of the cell so that you can then uh, clean up the clutter and make fresh ones. Uh, another one example is inflammation. So inflammation is something like when you get a cold, of course, you feel that effect of inflammation of uh, edema, you know, water collecting, maybe fever. But there's also a cellular level at which inflammation occurs that has important consequences. So you might have heard of the terms uh, interferon. And there may be lots of things that we still don't know that are important for understanding what a cellular age is like. Now, one of the things mentioned, of course, is telomeres, and this is something that has made a lot of popular press for a while. And so I do want to cover those a little bit specifically, because they also gave us insight uh, back in the day to what, what it means for cells to age. And so the graphic I'm showing here is an example of here you have a chromosome, 
and it's been duplicated. It's about to undergo uh, division to make new cells. And those little orange caps at the end, those are called telomeres. That's because they're at the end, telo, meaning distance. And what's there are important components of chromosomes because of the way that DNA replicates, it can't replicate the end of a chromosome. One part always shortens up. And that's why I use the term aglets. If you think about what would happen with shoelaces, you know, your shoelaces can eventually unravel if it's missing that little aglet at the end uh, and it frays apart. And this is something that happens in all cells as they're dividing. And what's important to know is that stem cells or early embryonic cells the ability to replenish telomeres is present. That's a compound known as telomerase. Uh, but what happens is most of our cells do not replenish the telomeres. Even our adult stem cells do not replenish telomeres. So there is, in essence, a limited amount of time cells can divide until those telomeres degrade away. And what I'm showing here on the bottom is a relatively recent review of this, a large-scale population assessment that's showing the length of telomeres, so the x-axis is the average length of telomeres within a sampled uh, population. And the different colors represent different ages. And so shifted far to the left, the uh, reddish orange are people who are centenarians. So they're very old, and that's also associated with shorter telomeres. And as the colors go more towards the blue and black range, those become younger. And so one thing that's some to recognize here is that as we're growing, our telomeres get shorter, and those are at some level a marker of how many rounds of replication our cells have gone through as well. And so that's associated with what our age is. Now, speaking of the chemistry of the cell, there's another very important chemical marker known as methyl groups. And so you might have heard of the gas methane. It's a a uh, highly volatile uh, compound, uh, air uh, gas, which is a carbon and four hydrogens. And so that term methyl, that methylation group, is what you see on the top compound, is you take a, uh, uh, a cy cysteine, or sorry, cytosine, and on the left, it's got that hexagon there, and on the right, you see in that red circle, a methyl group added onto it. And so it's a very small change in the chemistry. This can still act as a DNA base pair, but it ends up being a marker of whether genes are turned on or off. And so when it comes to any given cell in our body, it's differentiated in a way where certain genes are supposed to be on, certain genes are supposed to be off, and that's what helps essentially create the identity. And in some cases, if we need to turn a gene on, then the ability to demethylate it is important. If we want to turn a gene back off, then you want to remethylate it. And so this is a very important marker for whether genes uh, are on or off. And what's important that people discovered um, starting at the early part of the century, and I think it's most well characterized by uh, Dr. Horvath, who's the last citation, the last author in the citation is they found that if you measure the methylation at very specific sites within, um, within humans, again, you have to pick these carefully, that these end up having very strong correlations to cellular aging, as well as, and this is the important part, predictive power. They actually give a measure of one's health span and can be predictive for uh, lifespan. And so the important contrast here is that you might have heard of telomeres as an important thing for cellular aging, and they, they are, but in terms of their value of being using them to understand clinically the cellular age of a person, methylation is actually the most reliable uh, considered method for doing that. And in fact, there are methylation kits. If you ever wanted, you can now buy these. You can buy methylation kits to give you a sense of what your methylation clock age is. So so this is so so within um, a generalized way of understanding how old cells are, that's a, a kind of generally useful way of looking at methylation. Once it comes time to the clinic, 
or doing research models, there are other genes where you look at the expression of genes, whether they're on or off, that helps us get a sense of what's happening physiologically. So in terms of the larger um, sense, how do we model what is the aging process? I think this is uh, the most currently uh, accepted working model for understanding um, aging in the population. And the idea here is that when you think about evolution, you think about biology, it's very important that we get to our reproductive age and then we reproduce and have, again, in cases where we, as a parent, are also a caregiver to our offspring, again, there's a lot of what's known as parental care, a high R value, that our bodies can survive and be around for that process. And then after that, it doesn't really matter too much. And so that's the disposable soma idea is that, well, we have reproductive organs that are very important and the ability to raise the off, our offspring. After that, that's, there's not very much evolutionary action that's relevant and important for keeping us around longer. And so while we do go through developmental processes to get to reproductive age, it's not believed that there are reproductive pathways that then tell us to uh, become older and more frail. Now, so then why do we age? It's because we might be accumulating damage and clutter and problems in our cells because there's no reason not to, right? Eventually, we need to, we're going to die from the accumulation of junk and clutter. And I think the key questions that people have been asking for the longest time, once we start understanding these processes and whether we're able to measure them, and now that we're able to measure them, uh, is that reversible? And if it is reversible, is there a point of no return? In addition to understanding how we might actually do that reversing process. So that's what I'm gonna go through here in the next uh, series of slides. The bulk of my talk is going to be discussing from a more specific point of view, what are the things that, that lead to this accumulation of damage, what leads to a loss of cell identity, what leads to the things that we now then associate from a full body point of view with the aging process. So one of the first models that was actually proposed, uh, I think way back in the 1940s, is the free radical theory of aging. And the idea here is that Organisms age because they're doing chemistry. And when you're doing chemistry, you create reactive oxygen species, which then are partially reduced metabolites of molecular oxygen generated as products of metabolic reactions and or as byproducts of various cellular processes such as respiration. Just the mere act of breathing, you're making reactive oxygen species. And those reactive chemicals, as you're looking at some of them here on the left, I have some examples of what are known as reactive oxygen species that those then glom on and mess up the chemistry of other parts of the cell, either DNA or protein or the cell membrane and the lipids, and that that ultimately leads to a breakdown of the cellular processes. And that is what drives aging. Now, one thing I wanna point out here, uh, the way I have my talk, again, in order to keep the slides a little bit more uh, concise, sometimes it's very important to read the, the title of the citations at the bottom, because this is an example here where I got this from a, an article called The Free Radical Theory of Aging is Dead. <laughs> and that's because while this is a process that does occur in cells, there's not been significant amount of body of research to suggest that this is a main driver of the actual process. So for example, uh, taking antioxidant interventions has not been demonstrated to be a major uh, way to intervene in the aging process. Um, now there are things that are associated with reactive oxygen species like mitochondrial dysfunction that may be more correlated with a, the, the, as a driver of aging. But in terms of a fundamental process of aging, the free radical theory is not considered to be probably the major one anymore. Now, the overall idea that metabolism, however, is involved in aging, there's a lot of strong support for that. And if, again, if you look at people who have um, mutations or 
such variations in growth factors or other hormones, you can actually see differences in a uh, lifespan. And so the example I want to give here, though, is one uh, known as rapamycin, was originally discovered as an antifungal and then discovered in the clinic as a pretty useful uh, immunosuppressant. And then interestingly, the names of these genes, TOR1 and TOR2, they actually got their name because they were discovered as the target of rapamycin. That's where the name comes from. And as these compounds were looked at and examined in the lab, as people try to understand what TOR1 and TOR2 do in mouse models, as well as even other models like Drosophila, the fruit fly, or nematodes, like C. elegans, uh, they discover that they actually have the phenotypic consequence of extending lifespan. And so I'll give an example of that in the next slide. But merely giving um, model organisms rapamycin is able to basically slow down the aging process. And what I have here in the diagram is an example that these TOR1 and TOR2 proteins that are within these complexes, and what they do is they drive various various cellular processes, or they inhibit various cellular processes. And so they can drive inflammation. They can drive lipid synthesis. Uh, they can inhibit or drive protein synthesis. And so what's important to recognize is that they exist as uh, sensors of environmental metabolism, and then they drive the cell to do things that are responsive to that. And in fact, some of these things that drive uh, these cellular processes are associated with aging. So again, it's a way of connecting metabolism to what the cells are doing. And so what this next slide is showing, again, the top slide, this is a very common way using model organisms to try and understand if you were uh, intervening or changing the lifespan of an organism. And so these are, the x-axis here is the age of the mice in days. So mice on their own, lab mice tend to live on their own to about three, three years old, maybe only two years old, depending on what strain you have. And what they're, and so the normal, if you look at a population of mice, uh, they tend to follow this blue curve. Is that the as they get older, more in the population start to die, and then that curve goes down. And what these graphs are demonstrating is that you, if you start feeding the mice rapamycin at an early age within, um, uh, I believe, two months of being born, then that red graph, that red curve, is showing you that more of them are taking longer to die. And so that's an example of a lifespan extension curve. And so um, these effects tend to be stronger in females. Uh, how, why that is the case is not entirely understood. There are lots of interesting models for it, but I'm not gonna, not gonna get to the weeds on that one. And so, um, here's an, so, so rapamycin, and again, the microbiology associated with it is that it very clearly has effects that are beneficial to enhancing uh, health span and lifespan. Although, uh, in general, what's been found for human populations is that there are some negative side effects to it. So as a lifelong course of action, this is not something that people believe you should be taking right now as a way to extend your life, because then there can be health consequences where you actually don't get the benefit. Yeah, Janiel makes a very important point, which is we are not mice. <laughs> and so that's a, a key part. Uh, so I want to mention at this point, too, there's another compound known as metform metformin, which was a drug that was, uh, again, I don't know its origin, but was used to treat diabetes. And again, the same thing. When people are looking at mouse lifespan, expen lifespan extensions, they discovered that it does work for that. And so, again, through a lot of molecular characterization, they figured out what the targets of metformin are. And then also you'll see in the diagram that's here that mTOR is one of those downstream targets for, uh, for what metformin is doing within the cells. And so, again, is this one of these interesting points, too, is that, you know, if you're trying to, if you have a compound that's effective at doing something about diabetes and metabolism and sugar metabolism are relevant to aging, then it kind of makes sense that the actual specific mechanism for how it's treating diabetes is that's also doing stuff that helps with anti-aging. Although, again, those types of things usually need to be sorted out more specifically. So metabolism is a driver. It's related to the aging process, although, again, probably not through the reactive oxygen species.
And interventions that affect metabolism have an effect of improving uh, lifespan. So another major topic, another major driver of aging is this concept known as senescence. And so senescence as a cellular concept has been around since the 1960s. There was a researcher, um, Dr. Hayflick, and what he defined was something known as the Hayflick limit, that if you just take normal cells, put them in a culture, and let them grow, they eventually just stop growing. After about 60 or 70, uh, no, sorry, about 126 divisions, the cells just stop. Now, they don't die. They don't blow up. They just sit there. Uh, not do anything. And that became known as the Hayflick limit. And what I'm showing here on the left hand side is a more recent paper re examining this, but demonstrating one very important concept is that if you add back a, a, um, an enzyme that allows telomeres to be replenished during cell divisions, then this Hayflick limit doesn't, doesn't happen. And so the key point here is that telomeres are ultimately something that induces senescence as they get too short. Now, the program of senescence is something related to short telomeres. It's a, it's a cellular program to say stop growing. There's things that say, hey, something's going on here, so we need to senesce. And what I have here in the right diagram is uh, from a review describing how other things can impact cells to drive and create senescence. And that includes damage to the DNA. That includes mutations that are oncogenic. It also includes reactive metabolites. So again, all the stuff that's happening, uh, if it's at too high level, will cause cells to slow down. So those reactive oxygen species can create senescence. Uh, high mitogen signals, as well as proteotoxic stress. So if something's happening with the proteins that's causing them to misfold or um, not be replenished by lysosomes, by autophagy, then cellular senescence is something that can be driven by that. And so something that was discovered later, uh, much more recently in the, uh, I think about 2008 or so, is that not only does the cell senesce and decides it's taking itself out of the growth and the metabolism pathway, it also has something known as SASP, which is a senescence-associated secretory phenotype. And what's happening here is that neighboring cells can also basically go into senescence because the nearby senescent cell is saying, hey, you need to stop growing too. Now, all the details behind that are not clear, but you can imagine that if you have a body that's now developing a bunch of senescent cells and it's telling other cells to be senescent, that is something that can drive an aging process and the breakdown of, of cellular uh, processes and for the body. And so here's the full picture from this um, diagram. And that the idea here is that when you think about senescence, that when you're a young, healthy body with metabolism that's saying grow and get to reproductive age, uh, and you haven't had enough time to accumulate damage in cells, eh, that those exist, they're present, they're at a low level, it's not a big deal. But then once you pass a threshold of how many senescent cells you have, that can start driving chronic diseases or dysregulation. And so the idea is that if you can clear out and remove senescent cells, then actually you can get rid of all those, those disease states because you're helping get clearing out the cells that are causing them in the first place. And so in the very far diagram, this idea of a senolytic intervention, again, a drug, a drug or some other treatment that takes senescent cells and tells them to lice, in other words, to blow up, um, then that can come back. So I'm getting something from Eel that the uh, transcript is um, hit the limit. I thought it was a 45 minute limit. So let me set up a new one. And I'll be right back to creating a new one. Okay, I'll record a new one and set you a new link in just a second. Okay, and I'll put it in local chat. Okay, so that's your fresh transcript link. All right, now, does this work? So if that theory of if you can clear out senescent cells, does it actually help de-age something? And so here's an example of something that's very, well, it looks like a very complicated set of data, and it's a lot of work that goes into it. 
there's actually some very basic trends to look at from the graph on the bottom side. And what is, the researchers did here is they recognize that there's an enzyme called lysosomal beta-galactosidase that is specifically activated in sen senescent cells. So they created a compound that that enzyme acts on it. And if that enzyme acts on it, it creates something that kills the cells. And so what they're showing here in the, in the basically in each one of these graphs, each one of these graphs is an example of how well the mice are performing a physical task. And on the very left-hand side, you have young mice, then middle-aged mice, and then old mice. And you can see that for most of the graphs, the average, the cluster, is going down. But if you take old mice and create a compound that's clearing out the senescent cells, that's what you have there in pink, you'll notice that those averages go back up. And so uh, this is an example of how this type of intervention, as you measure various objective ways of understanding, say, frailty or some other index of an aging process, then this intervention helps alleviate that aging process. And so uh, the idea that senolytics work then is something that also does make sense for how we understand the, some of the drivers of aging as well as interventions that can help with that. And so people are trying to find what were so-called senolytics where you don't have to have that are like this that end up having broad applicability that target very specific cells in the body. Another driver of, of aging is inflammation. So inflammation is the type of body response that you have to infection. Uh, so you think when we think of fevers or cells trying to um, mobilize to repel a virus or a bacteria. And, and just like, um, and then there are also very specific subcellular processes that are inflammation responses as well. And just like if you have a cold, you don't want to be walking around with a fever when you're not being uh, you know, attacked by an invader. Having inflammation is great to have on a short-term basis, but it's not good in a long-term basis. And what this graph is showing is that one of the key regulators of this is a, is a gene known as NF-kappa-B. NF-kappa-B is something that tells other genes to turn on. And that there's a whole complex set of things that's happening from an inflammation response. And that that inflammation response is that because you're setting up to try and repel an invader, all the stuff that this is like a, a, a nation going to war, that all the normal domestic economic things that you would have during a war don't work as well. And so combating inflammation is something that's been recognized for a long time as something to try and tamp down, even in the aging process. And so what I'm showing here on the left-hand side in terms of interventions that can help with inflammation are that there are other genes in the cell that tell NF-kappa B to be on or off. And what you see here on the left-hand side is another one of these lifespan uh, measurements of mice, where if you are uh, a normal, untreated, non-intervention mouse, it's that red line, and that's your, your death curve in this particular case. If you're activating NF-kappa B by adding IKK beta, then you actually decrease the lifespan. That's the blue, uh, the blue graph. And then the green is showing that if you're inhibiting NF-kappa B, then you can, get, you can get a lifespan extension because you're now inhibiting the inflammatory process uh, within those organisms. Now, again, these are caged mice. It's good to have an inflammation response. You wouldn't necessarily want to walk around having that always turned off because then that makes you susceptible to diseases. So, you know, this has to be something that's very targeted and clear. Uh, but this group also showed something very interesting is that when they were looking specifically at inactivation, or sorry, overactivation of the immune response in the hypothalamus, which is important for making hormones and regulating hormones in the body, that those decreased. And if you intervene by adding gonadotropin-releasing hormone, basically injections back into the mice, that those helped alleviate some of these aging effects that you see when they are being inflamed. And so the idea here is that there are some very important ways in which inflammation can uh, degrade cellular processes, the hormone signaling, what the body's doing. And in fact, an intervention can be to make sure that you are uh, compensating for those processes. Like in this case, adding back more hormones that are being depleted. Um, 
So Shiloh brings up an important question, which is, um, I think, you know, when you go to the doctor and you have your blood levels measured and other stuff, there's lots of things that are markers of health. And sometimes those markers of health are also related to the aging process. Uh, but again, they aren't necessarily diagnostic for how old you are, what the aging is, whereas something like methylation is maybe potentially a little more insight into specific aging processes. But being healthy is all a part of this, is that uh, you want to make sure, you know, uh, there are times where if you have some part of your system that is compromised, that can actually spill over and drive um, other further sickness or health problems. Like having diabetes is something that can lead to cardiovascular problems. Okay, so let me, another key driver of aging that's been appreciated for a long time is damage to the DNA. And this has been, uh, the insight from this came from progeroid syndromes. And these are uh, syndromes in which a young person ages dramatically. So you see on the top left-hand side, there's a Werner syndrome patient at the age of 15. And then at the age of 48, she looks a lot more like a pretty um, frail 85, 90-year-old. Another Werner syndrome patient on the right, same thing, is that at 13, they look fairly, they, they look normal. But by the age of 56, they look like they're 90. And what's also associated with these progeroid syndromes are, you know, they typically die early because of some sort of tissue failure or organ failure, like heart attack. Um, there are a wide variety of these. And what's important is that the genes that underlie these syndromes are things that are known to be in the pro that are important for repairing DNA. And so one particular type of DNA damage is known as the double strand break. So DNA has two strands. And if you break through both of those at the same time, that's a double strand break. And so the failure to repair these is something that, at least in these progeroid syndromes, is clearly associated with creating aging phenotypes. Although how well that's related to the general aging process has not been uh, clearly delineated um, up until I'd say the relatively past, past 15, maybe 10 years. And here's an example of that, that the research in this case is showing that if you look at post-mortem samples of people diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease or people that had, were diagnosed with mild cognitive impairment, MCI, but then post-mortem, you know that they have some degree of Alzheimer's degree onset. If you actually look at those cells from those postmortem tissues, those little green dots represent double strand breaks. And that's because they're using immunofluorescent staining that to a protein, and those proteins associated with double strand breaks. And this graph is showing that compared to control tissue samples, there are lots more of these double strand breaks that are present in the neurons or the astroglia of these MCI or Alzheimer's disease diagnosed uh, individuals. And so there's, again, there's this association double strand breaks with leading to aging type phenotypes. And another set of research on the right that I'm showing here is that when you look at human, female human uh, tissues, they start showing a decrease in the ability to repair double strand breaks. And so the chart graph is showing how quickly things are getting repaired and the fact that young donors, a lot more is repaired quickly and early compared to age donors. That's an example of that. Okay, so the last kind of major theory of aging uh, in terms of how we understand the process at a cellular level is something known as the loss of epigenetic information, or also known as the information theory of aging. And this comes back to the idea where I talked about before with methylation, is that certain genes in the cell are supposed to be on, certain genes are supposed to be off. And if that gets dysregulated, then the cell may not know what it's supposed to be doing. And so this graphic is showing here, this is A, B, and C are nicely organized. The chromatin, the DNA is nicely organized by the proteins that package it up. And on the right-hand side, you're showing that that's, I'm showing that that's not the case. And so uh, this theory uh, makes a lot of sense. And in fact, if this, one reason to think that this is a really important way to think about cellular aging is related to the fact that a diagnostic assay for disorganization of genes, methylation, ends up being one of the best predictors for cellular aging. And what I have here, again, this is another big, large graph, I know, but the key point is that if you reset the cell's differentiation, 
And this is the Nobel Prize, I think in 2012, was for Yamanaka. And what he discovered was the ability to basically take adult cells and turn them back into stem cells. So induce pluripotent cells. And those Yamanaka factors basically de-differentiated an adult cell, a skin cell, back to being like an embryonic cell. And what these researchers are showing here is if you basically do something for a very short amount of time where you just say, let's just gently prod these to be a little bit younger, then um, you can alleviate and help reset the methylation patterns. And so these graphs are showing here in different types of cases for different genes and different ways of looking at uh, membrane potentials, mitochondrial, reactive oxygen species, the health of cells is on the left-hand side, you have young cells that are blue, you have old cells that are red, and so you notice red is usually on average lower than blue, but that aqua color, this is the, the cells that have an intervention to try and help reset their methylation to a younger state, you notice that that's coming back up more towards the blue, and so that's an example of, a, of this intervention that works. Um, another thing that's important to recognize, and this is work by David Sinclair, who's one of the um, key people driving a lot of this information theory work forward, is that if you just induce double-strand breaks using an intervention, they're using an enzyme to make double-strand breaks, that you see the same loss of, of information within the cells. And so uh, these, the model here is known as ICE, so basically the induction of chromosomal damage. And what the right-hand graph is showing is that you take normal cells, their epigenetic age um, is about what, what you expect them to be. But once you start inducing double-strand breaks, then their epigenetic age skyrockets to be really high. And so one thing that's important, one thing that this experiment was trying to differentiate is that it's the creation of double-strand breaks, but not necessarily the creation of mutations. Because one of the reasons people thought people aged was the accumulation of mutations. And in fact, it's actually double strand breaks that may help in, be a matter of the resetting the epigenetics. And this makes sense. The reason why this model makes sense is that if you're making a break in something, well, if you have that within a package, if you have that within packaging, you need to remove the packaging to repair it. And then it, the efficiency of putting that packaging back is problematic. It's like, if you're looking, like if you want to know what somebody is sending somebody else in an envelope, well, you can open the envelope and see what's inside, but to make it look like you never open that envelope, that's not as easy. And so that may be what's happening on a cellular level. So in terms of kind of putting this together, you know, what a lot of the research has been showing over the past 15, 20 years from this molecular and cellular biology level is that Genomic instability, inflammation, and this loss of epigenetic programming can be very important drivers that may even be the initial initiating causes. But in each case, when you look at any one of these factors that you're driving, it tends to drive the other factors forward as well. And so there are kind of, there's a good and bad part of this is that one, the bad part is once you start driving one of these processes forward, it starts a snowball effect where there's feedback that causes more of that problem. On the other hand, and I'll talk about this a little bit later, it also means that if you can target one of these, in some cases, it actually helps um, reset the rest as well. So what are the consequences for this? How do we want to think about that? I've seen some questions like, well, how is this important for the clinic or what can I do? Well, what we're seeing right now is a large number of people developing research and proposing clinical trials where within various types of aging, chronic diseases, or even trying to prevent certain chronic diseases, can we intervene with removing senescent cells? Can we have compounds or gene therapy that reduces inflammation? How can we reduce genetic instability? How can we reverse the program in the cells? The idea of putting in transient Yamanaka factors to rejuvenate cells and tissues is very, uh, very much at the forefront of the research that's going on here. Um, and I'll come back to the questions at the end. Let me finish here. Um, and so 
but then that maybe that's not the key question, right? Because I mean, so certainly if you have something, you want to keep an eye out in literature for whether there are interventions where if you're at the hospital or you go to the doctor or your annual physical exam or the things that they can say or recommend. Right now, you can't go request these. These are not something that as a patient, you can go to the doctor and say, hey, give me senolytics. So in terms of what can we do? Well, one of the interesting um, key parts of this, and this is one example, there are others, but that this compound NAD seems to be a key metabolite in helping have healthy inflammation, healthy DNA repair, healthy epigenetics. And so the um, concept here and what's known is that your levels of NAD go down as you get older. So what's driving those to go down? It's not exactly entirely clear, but once those levels start going down, it's like I said before, that can start driving further aging forward. And so what I have here are some examples from, of some research where they show that if you basically give um, mice a compound that helps increase their levels of NAD in their body, then you can see an actual increase in the NAD. So those are the red bars compared to the black bars. But if you look at the lower graph, this is one example of a phenotypic effect where if you're measuring how well they can run a treadmill, then uh, if you take age-matched mice, the ones that have higher NAD levels are running better. And so again, the idea that here is a metabolite, something that can be influenced by diet or, or maybe supplements, is an idea of um, something that is a intervention that we can participate in. And there are compounds out there where people say, hey, there are things that a little bit like act like senolytics. There are these things that are slightly anti-inflammatory. Again, any, any tea that comes out these days are trying to tell you how it has this health benefit for this or that. And so what's, um, what I want to describe here is that when we think about interventions, there's what's known as the Gero science hypothesis. And that when you think about your diet, when you think about these compounds, uh, or things that might be analogs of them that you can have in your diet, then these are things that may be in inhibiting fundamental aging mechanisms. So I've talked about some of these, the DNA damage, epigenetics, reactive oxygen species, what's happening in metabolism, that there are compounds that have these effects just from normal everyday eating or, um, or might be available as a supplement. And so if you can inhibit those fundamental aging mechanisms, then you can help stave off the aging phenotypes and you can have benefits of a healthier, uh, longer life. Uh, can they get to the point necessarily of re rejuvenating you? Probably not. Again, those that the ability to rejuvenate probably mostly comes from things that are molecular biology interventions. But this last diagram here is just trying to integrate this into the whole that, you know, when you think about exercise, having low uh, fat tissue, adipose tissue, a healthy diet and calorie restriction. Again, calorie restriction in particular, these are all things that have been shown to boost the body's NAD levels. These are things that have been shown to reduce inflammation. And when people measure methylation of people doing exercise or different types of diet, then these are things that help with the methylation. And that's actually, I mean, that's one thing to be very fair about is that if you are, th if you are, if these types of compounds can help from a physiological measurement point, make your methylation patterns younger, and this is something Syzygy is mentioning about NMM, NMN in the chat, is that you, this might actually be an intervention that does, in a sense, rejuvenate. Now, the thing that's limiting is that you aren't necessarily getting that compound into every tissue. Um, but again, if you make some tissues healthier, then adjacent tissues can become healthier. So there's a lot that can go on. And, and that's one of the key points is that when you think about these interventions that help with basic cellular processes, once you start helping one process, the reason why you can look at a measurement of NAD and say, oh, we're also associating this with better inflammation, better autophagy, better nervous system, a, a decline in aging phenotypes, is because this, these are all integrated as a whole. Okay, so in summary, uh, you know, the last 20 years have been pretty amazing for understanding the basics and physiology of the aging process. We have a lot more about the ideas of what aging is at the cellular level and how that relates to tissue and the whole body. And what's wonderful is that they're not mutually exclusive. These are all things that seem to be related. 
Uh, in animal models and human cells, and to some degree in clinical trials, there are compounds and interventions that can slow the process of aging and can also reverse aging. Uh, now, again, how much of these are true things that can be effective and worth your time and money to do as an individual is, I think, still, um, still under investigation and not entirely clear cut. But that what we do have now is that we think about our lifestyles, we think about what we do in terms of <clears throat> healthy eating, exercise, uh, what types of food we eat, what types of activities we engage in, is that this new cellular understanding helps reinforce and provides the rationale for the concept that healthy living is the best way to stave off the Grim Reaper. So with that, I thank you for your attention. I'm here and happy to take any sorts of questions and um, hope you enjoy. So there's a really interesting question in the chat. So I'm happy to take some questions, and I can I I, I didn't quite time my talk right, so I'll I'll stay around a little bit extra. You know, this question that Roy asks and Sizzu G brought up: Should I take an NAD supplement? And I will say, from from my own scientific point of view, I, I'm not sure that there's been enough high quality gold standard double clinical double blind studies of large scales of people to say that spending say two dollars a day gives you you know after you spent several thousand dollars buying them a thousand dollars in benefit for your lifespan what i will say is that when you look at the nad supplementation in various clinical interventions and um and there are there are clinical trials that are ongoing and so you might want to sign up for a clinical trial you could always do that um, there does seem to be some value in de-aging benefit as you measure it. Um, you know, so, you know, I, the one thing I will say about NAD supplements, as you look at most of them, they all have very high um, safety profiles. They, they are not shown, compared to the benefits you see in human trials that are short-term, the downsides of them are incre incredibly minimal. And so, you know, the opportunity cost there is, are you wasting your money on something that doesn't help you very much, and you could use that money for better purposes? However, I think, you know, if you overall look at what happens with clinical trials and the data you have, um, and again, these are clinical trials on healthy people. These are, they're signing up healthy people to see if these, if these have these de-aging or stave off aging effects. Um, I, you know, you could, if it, well, so wisdom brings up an important point, you know, and that's why it's really important to do really good clinical trials that are also being managed and run by independent agencies with a lot of transparency in the data is that placebo effects can can affect and mess up results. Yeah, I mean, I think people have shown that you, you can have um, five grams of of NMN per day without any sort of negative health consequence. But then how much benefit, that's, that's going to cost you a lot of money. Um, Stephen, I wonder if you saw my question. Which one was it? Uh, if at an advanced age, one has had no major diseases and has a normal blood panel, what does that indicate about these biological considerations? It's interesting. Uh, that's actually a really interesting question because one thing I didn't delve into very much today is that there's been a lot of research that has looked at the genes of long-lived people. And there are genes and alleles of genes that are associated with people who just naturally live very long lives, these centenarians. Um, and so in many ways, what's interesting is, you know, taking supplementation may not help people who are already pretty healthy and have lived long, good lives and have, you know, eat healthy. Uh, they may have, the, the amount of effect they have might not be very dramatic compared to someone who, whose genes are kind of driving them to an earlier aging phenotype. On the other hand, one thing that's very clear, this accumulation of damage 
model means that every little bit that you can push uh, push the metabolism towards less aging, the earlier you do it and the, the longer you do it, then the more benefit you can get in the long run. And so, um, you know, I, I, I think at whatever age you have, whatever age you are and whether you're healthy or not, there are very good rationales for doing healthy things in terms of your diet, your exercise, and potentially with supplementation. Does that make sense? Does that answer your question? No. <laughs> I'm asking what you can, um, uh, are there any assumptions you can make in looking at a totally normal whole blood panel, uh, blood labs? And and uh, the fact that one has had no major diseases, in uh, and correlating that with the stuff that you're talking about. Yeah, well, so okay, so well, that, so I did kind of answer your question, <laughs> which is that one of the inferences we have now, in in terms of long lived people and the genetics that help them, is that health span is very much related to lifespan. So if you are a person who has really just traditionally not gotten very sick, not had any major diseases, but yeah, that's probably due to some genetics that has helped you get there in the first place. Mm -hmm. And so we are learning about this. And that that is lots of research that's going on is trying to take populations of people, correlate their methylation clocks with their chronological age, with their with their lifestyle and their their how healthy they've been and trying to understand those genes that are involved with that. Can you infer anything from that? Again, from an individual point of view, that's hard. You might just be, might've just been lucky. You know, that's the other aspect of it too, from an individual. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, but I mean, I, I, but I still want to just reiterate too, is that, you know, if you've had a healthy, you, you might think you're lucky and you might be very lucky, but no matter what's happening, that you've had a healthy life, this accumulation of damage and hitting these thresholds, these are things that are, are inevitable for everyone under normal living lifestyle conditions. And so there's always this inevitability of the aging process, uh, unless you're doing things that push it to rejuvenate or almost be at a standstill. And those are almost always very specific interventions you have to do uh, with how we understand aging these days. So I see a question. Is that now? Does that answer your question? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I was surprised when you said that antioxidants are are kind of moot. Um, I, I was interested in because I read a research about astaxanthin, which uh, <clears throat> is a very powerful antioxidant. And from what you said, that doesn't matter that much. Well, okay, so let me let me also just make a, a, a quick clarification about that too, which is, you know, as a driver of the aging process, you know, reactive oxygen species does not seem to be at the level they're present in normal people to be a clear driver of that. Now, the thing is an antioxidant, like the actual compound you're talking about, just like I talked about with metformin and rapamycin, is that compound, if it's known to be helpful for reactive oxygen species, it actually could have other effects on the body too. And in cases where there can be, like in, my, in mitochondrial dysfunction, you can have an uptick in reactive oxygen species. And then those reactive oxygen species can drive inflammation. Inflammation is very sensitive to reactive oxygen species. And so one thing to keep in mind is that there may still be spaces and interventions in here where you know, you're targeting and you have compounds that are known to target reactive oxygen species. And in a normal physiological healthy state, that doesn't do much. But in certain cases, it may actually be helping with an overabundance from another mechanism that's creating problems. And it could help intervene in one of these main drivers. And then the other possibility is that the compound just actually has a target that people don't appreciate. So, you know, if people have done clinical trials where you've had, you know, double blind studies, people have done efficacy profiles of any given compound, you can still have an effect, you can still be, they can still be beneficial. They just may not be for the reason that they're being advertised. 